Well, hello everybody. Sorry for that little bit of a hiccup. I um, was having some major troubles getting this thing going. Uh, technology and all that fun stuff. I am currently rebooting my computer, so I'm going to just take a minute here to find my place yet again, in spite of the fact that I had this all taken care of. Um, so welcome, if those of you watching, to Pilgrim of the Sky Live. This is the live reading of my novel, Pilgrim of the Sky, which came out from Candle Mark and Gleam. You can follow me over here um, at Natanya Barron on Twitter, or follow me at my blog if you want. Um, if you've been following along, and I hope you have, we are currently um, with Randall and Matilda and Maddie in this sort of strange little triangle that they've got going on. Um, if you remember the last chapter, Matilda and Maddie have made sort of a tenuous connection and agreed that they're going to work together to try to help get Maddie back to her world. So um, I'm going to start off with chapter seven, and it is called Trysts and Trials. Chapter seven, Trysts and Trials. On the way, Matilda explained that Georgiana Dark, de Montpré, was spending much of the week at one of her many homes, a colonial marvel overlooking the bay, and since she never went out of her own accord, they had to drop by. Maddie was amazed to see what a transformation the Bay Area had undergone in this Boston. It was as residential as could be imagined. Industry was reserved for further north, Matilda informed her. The builders of Second World had done a rather impressive job rerouting some of the waters that way and constructing elaborate underground locks for such business. Despite the occasional smokestack and airship, this Boston seemed to shun the visible representation of its technologies. But, supposed Maddie, in a world with magic, a concept she was still trying to wrap her head around, technology must not be so necessary. It really isn't like that, said Matilda, tugging on her gloves and flexing her fingers. Maddie had been thinking, sulking again, in the corner of the woman's mind, and was surprised that she was even being addressed. Throughout the ride to this part of Boston, Matilda had all but ignored her. Isn't it like that? she asked. Magic? Not like what you think it is, said Matilda. Not fairies and sprites and unicorns. But dragons, I hear, said Maddie. Dragon is just a word, Matilda said. Use whatever one you prefer. Prophet, godling, avatar. As no one was driving the carriage and one of the countless services would be greeting Matilda upon her arrival, there was no worry about talking aloud, at least for the present time. If you stop thinking of green, scaly things, that might help you. Magic is, well, it's people. It's human beings doing extraordinary things. It's traveling in time and space, ascending to unfathomable truths, or in some cases, descending to unimaginable depravity. So where do we fit? asked Maddie. I mean, how does magic work with twins? It's a curious question, said Matilda. You know, we have gifts, you and I. We can do things some men only dream of. The ability to travel between dimensions being the least of... What do you mean? asked Maddie. Have you ever stopped to consider your ability to woo men and women, come to think on it, when you're single-minded about it? Uh, like sexuality? asked Maddie. Sexuality or otherwise. Your ability to communicate, to seduce... You're very good. Randall was almost unable to resist. Tell me, have you ever failed to get someone into bed with you if you really, really wanted them? Had she? She'd never really thought about it. When she was younger, she'd been shy, but later, when she'd realized her own sexuality that had changed, not just her first boyfriends, not Agnes. No, come to think on it, she'd never been dumped. Not counting Alvin, of course, but that was its own unique situation. And clearly I'm very good, better than even you imagine, said Matilda. And brazen, said Maddie. Why shouldn't I be, asked Matilda. Randall knew what I was when I married him. My abilities are a celebration of all that I am, all that we women are. I thought that was what having children was supposed to be, said Maddie. Matilda fell silent. Her lecture interrupted. She folded her hands primly, resting them in her lap. How positively medieval of you, Madeline. Well, that's not the point, she said. 
Sensuality is a gift if used correctly. I'm only asking you to look at yourself with a different pair of eyes. Embrace what you have. Right. Well, forgive me if I don't join up with a brothel, said Maddie. But Maddie knew what Matilda meant, harsh words aside, and recognized that she was right too. There was an undeniable power in sexuality and sensuality, and Randall had helped to awaken that. The incident in the kitchen was overwhelming, and she didn't think she should be ashamed of it, she realized. It was an ancient power. Any glance through an art history text, even the basic ones, would demonstrate the influence of the female form all across cultures, religions, and traditions, not to mention the act of love. Though she would have liked to think on it more, Matilda had other ideas. It was time to tend to Georgiana d'Arc. The carriage came to a stop aside one of the palatial cottages by the bay, this one numbered 879, and Matilda wearily lifted herself from the seat. It was just beginning to rain, and a red-clothed butler helped her down from the carriage, an umbrella ready in his hand. The swatches are in the trunk, Matilda said, taking the umbrella, and do be careful with them. Those pieces of cloth are worth more than your life. The butler goggled at her and then retrieved the leather suitcase. Georgiana is not a Marian, said Matilda internally, as they moved through the Countess's home toward the sitting room, just so you're aware. Though the home was certainly grand, it was as simple as Farley was elegant. Everything was smooth, straight, colonial, as if the home had not changed from the late 18th century, which was impossible since the house was a recent construction. It still smelled of planed wood and fresh paint. But clearly, architects here were more than happy to provide houses designed in a historical, straightforward manner. Everything looked authentic, hand-milled, and far from fabricated. The home was characterized by dark wooden floors accented with periwinkle blue walls and Spartan crown molding, clean and crisp, but decidedly boring carpets and minimal wall decoration. Everything was antique, or else a high-quality reproduction, but nothing moved with the vibrancy of the Roth home or the Hildebrands. Looks like she hasn't moved past the colonial period, Maddie said. She's a Quaker, explained Matilda, an adulteress with a pious side, intriguing. She grows on you, I promise, said Matilda. Maddie turned with Matilda and saw Georgiana d'Arc de Montpré, sitting on a ladder back chair, engrossed in some extraordinary crochet, delicate and as intricate as a spider web. Madame Roth, announced a voice, and Georgiana looked up. It took Maddie a moment to register what she'd seen in the face, what with all the black lace and velvet hanging about her. She looked as if she were dressed for a mortician's funeral. But Georgiana's face was nearly identical to that of Mrs. Frances Keats, like enough to be a sister. A stab of fear and shame coursed through her, but Maddie was not enough control to do anything about it. Matilda had the reins. Georgiana, darling, Matilda said, coming up to the woman and taking her hand gently when it was offered. The woman's hands were frigid despite the roaring fire in the hearth and very fragile, as if the bones beneath would crush like twigs should Maddie exert enough pressure. The woman looked far from depressed, her eyes but all but twinkling, though her smile did not last long. Her eyes were not like Frances's, thought Maddie. No, Frances had vibrant blue eyes and Georgiana's were brown, almost a black in the dim light. No, perhaps not a twain. No, not a twain, said Matilda inwardly, but close. She's unusually similar to another, which explains Alvin's infatuation. How do you know she's not a twain? asked Maddie. Matilda did not answer, and Ted, she turned her attention to Georgiana. How are you managing? asked Matilda. It was then, as Maddie struggled to let go of the anger brought on by Alvin's infidelity, that she realized Georgiana was entirely blind. When the Countess was asked the question, she tilted her head to the side, but her eyes did not follow. I'm well, Georgiana said. I didn't know you were paying me a visit today, and in this weather of all things. It's no trouble, and it's just a little snow. The carriage is well equipped, said Matilda breezily. She clicked open the suitcase with her thumbs and then set it on the table, rifling through the pieces of fabric quickly, searching for one in particular. Maddie was waiting, still and silent, trying to piece together the rather sordid background of her once fiancé. The first two times she'd been under Maddie's, Matilda's control, she'd had to endure sex with strangers. Though this was nowhere near as disconcerting, she wasn't sure if it was less painful or cruel. 
New samples, said Matilda. We've some beautiful brocaded velvet I was thinking would complement the last gown rather well, just in from Jamaica. Excellent. I'd love to feel it, said Georgiana, extending her fingers and placing them, her crochet down. As Georgiana explored the various panels, a butler arrived with tea and scones. Matilda dismissed him and took it upon herself to make the tea for Georgiana. She knew precisely how she took her tea, and if Mattie hadn't known better, she'd almost thought that the two women were having another affair. But no, there was no sense of lust coming from Matilda. Simply love, and respect, and even a little appreciation. You admire her, Mattie said. A bit. Yes, she's a good woman, said Matilda. And Alvin, asked Mattie. He admires her too, but in a different way. I think he might pity her as well. The two have a bond, and a special one. Apparently that outshines the bonds of, well, you know, marriage or engagement, said Mattie. It isn't just about sex. You realize Georgiana was married to Montpre when she was 16. She suffered to the best years of her life with a man old enough to be her grandfather. That he's died has set her free. I like this one, said Georgiana holding up dark red swatch so deep it was nearly black. A damask pattern was pressed into the velvet. Do you think you might be able to put this into the lining of the sleeves? Oh, come now, Matilda said. Lining? We can put it on the bodice. It would set the whole city astir. Georgiana giggled into her hand, shaking her head. Oh, no, that is the last thing I want, dear Mattie. As you will, said Matilda with a laugh. I'll put aside a little extra for you, though, with the next order Randall makes, just to make sure we have enough if you happen to change your mind. How is your husband? asked Georgiana, moving the material again back and forth between her fingers. A single line now appeared between her brows, turning her round and placid face more severe. She looked concerned. Matilda took her seat again, inhaling the soft floral tones of Earl Grey tea before answering. Yes, he's been a little under the stress of late what with Alvin's return from abroad and his sudden disappearance. I swear we cannot keep that man down. Alvin is missing? asked Georgiana, her voice soft, unsure. Setting her teacup, a surprisingly vibrant bone china pattern with interlacing sweet pea motif, back on her saucer, Matilda nodded. Three days gone, gone without a trace. A moment passed between the two women and some sort of understanding was made, but Maddie couldn't guess how. It couldn't have been the eye contact. Alvin visited me briefly, three days ago, said Georgiana, sitting straighter in her chair. She cut a surprisingly buxom shape, thrusting out her chest as she did so. She was not quite so slight as Matilda, but the sharpness of her chin and thinness of her fingers and wrist had given Maddie that illusion. He seemed distracted. He's always distracted, said Matilda. Maddie was pulled slightly forward, feeling herself get a better grip of the situation. It had been a while since Matilda's last bit of special tea, and it wouldn't be long before Mattie was in control again. But not now. She needed Matilda. She needed the details. She needed to know, even if it cut a hole in her heart. Both she and Randy were owed answers, and damned if she wasn't going to go down without a fight. Georgiana smiled, a little too knowingly. He is always, though, isn't he? But this time he sounded more fretful than before. He mentioned something about a meeting with some of the priestesses and settling a debt of his in Charleston. But he's always talking like that, and... She paused, taking a sip of tea before adding, We hadn't seen each other for quite some time, and we didn't spend much time in conversation. It was as blatant as Maddie could stand. She wanted to reach over and slap the woman, both for what she learned in her own world and what she was experiencing here. For someone with purported powers of seduction, they seemed to fail her at the moment. Alvin walked out the door and into the arms of another woman. Decorum, darling, Matilda warned, and Maddie complied. Georgiana leaned forward conspiratorially, but her eyes lit the wrong mark. The motion came off as wooding, awkward. It made her pretty round face seem like a doll. Truth be told, and not a word of this to Randall, if you please, Georgiana said. On my honor, Matilda said very quickly. I just think he is in over his head. He is a brilliant mind, to be sure. Perhaps the greatest of a generation, the greatest in the last dozen generations. But the nature of his work is delicate, and he takes too much upon himself. He seems suspicious to me of everything. So I gave him some money. He tried to refuse, but I insisted. 
What am I going to do with it now that Edgar is gone? Our debts are settled, his last being the final nail in his coffin, so to speak, she said. She bristled a little at the mention of her husband and shivered. Quite honestly, I want to see as much of the money done away with as possible. I don't fancy it'll be involved with the family much longer. Just long enough, and then I'll fade away into obscurity. Oh, dearest, don't speak like that. You can marry again. You're still young, encouraged Matilda. Maddie thought it sounded painfully fake. And barren, and jaded, and blind? I have no interest in playing such games. You know that hasn't stopped you before. Georgiana almost smiled and then shook her head. If he's gone to anyone, it's just Raddick. Raddick? The captain of the River Guard? Matilda said the name as if she'd heard it only but once or twice, yet Maddie caught a glimpse of the man in her mind, naked as a jaybird and rippled with muscle and scarred in a thousand places from head to foot. Mustachioed, blonde, eyes like jet. Yes, he was quite a presence. Alvin mentioned a particular debt that he hoped Joss could help him with. I gave him enough to settle it. I hoped he would make the trip and return within a day, she paused, frowning a little guiltily. Please let me know if you find him. Of course, dear, Matilda said, touching her friend on the cheek. Of course. They chatted for some time after, but Maddie remained quiet and just listened. She was feeling sorry for herself. She wanted to hate Georgiana, but she was a sweet woman who had clearly lived a more difficult life than Maddie had. The hardest part was that she liked her, admired her even, and felt sorry to leave her all alone in that cavernous home. She might have had Alvin's attention, but she had little else in the world. When they reached the carriage again, Maddie asked, So what can you tell me about Joss Raddick? Matilda laughed aloud. Not yet, darling. First, you've got a ball to attend. They returned at last to Farley, and Matilda acquired a bottle of wine from California she claimed to be a world-famous vintage. Maddie didn't recognize it, but barely got a taste in as Matilda drank it down quickly, using her last strength to concentrate on the alcohol. As Matilda informed her, they were already running late for the gala event that evening at Count Gaskin's mansion, and Maddie required some lessons before gallivanting around in public as Matilda Roth. As they bustled about the house, Matilda lectured. She explained how close James, Count Gaskin, was to the Queen, and that there was always a possibility that Victoria herself might make an appearance. As it was, not even Matilda had met the Queen in person yet, but James had sworn up and down that she was planning to attend one of his events soon. She couldn't confirm when, due to the delicate matter of the situation, but it was a way to ensure plenty of positive replies from the elite. Due to the importance of the event, Matilda chose their clothing very carefully. James's favorite color was green, something she knew from her rather intimate involvements with the quite eligible bachelor. So with Mrs. Fitz's help, Matilda assembled her costume. It was so elaborate that it could be called nothing but. Out of silk and taffeta, lace and satin, all green as the sea in the summer. Set with a copper corset, the contrast was stunning. Mrs. Fitz combed Matilda's hair until it shone, and then curled it up delicately along her neck, the twists kissing the length of her shoulder. Peacock feathers, both green and albino variety, were then placed along the ringlets. Makeup was thick, but hollowed out her prolonged use of opium, with powder, brush, lush, liner, and lipstick, beautifully enhanced. She almost looked healthy. Then came the jewelry, the garnets, the opals, the necklace set with amber and emeralds. They had a light of their own against Matilda's alabaster skin. Then one more detail, a spray of perfume, somewhere between lilacs and vanilla, misted about her shoulders. Beautiful, admittedly, Maddie said. We clean up rather well, I suppose, not as fetching as in my day when I was your age. I was a little fuller then, closer to the ideal. As you'll see when we arrive, the current fashion is... How shall we say it? Well, you remember Rubens? Yes, the master of butterfat, said Maddie. Rubens would be well at home with our ladies, shall I say? The rounder, the better, in the eyes of society. But as in your culture, some take the ideal to the extreme. It would almost be comical if it weren't so sad. I haven't seen many women that seemed abnormal, said Maddie. My darling, you've yet to see the truly elite. In your world, they risk their deaths to look like bags full of antlers. Here, they do the opposite. It isn't all so different, is it? Regardless, the coach will take you to the landing, and you will meet Randall there. Then you can see for yourself. I'm still pissed at him, said Maddie. Oh, I'm sure you'll be running like rabbits before the evening is over. We will not. As if in punctuation to her comment, 
Matilda ran her hands down her breasts and shivered. Maddie felt every thrill, and their shared body flushed magnificently. Maddie was about to protest further when she noticed she'd been granted the reins again. It felt so marvelous, breathing of her own volition and seeing the world as she wanted, that she forgot her indignation entirely. She swished her dress from side to side and giggled. She had never worn such a beautiful ensemble, and she was certainly more used to Matilda's clothing by now. I abhor this sort of thing, said Matilda in the back of her mind. And I could certainly use the evening off. Consider it a gift from my side. The wine did the trick. Matilda, said Maddie, unexpectedly through Matilda's lips. She put a hand over her mouth. What's that, dear? asked Mrs. Fitz. Nothing, thank you, Mrs. Fitz, sighed Maddie, and shrugged at the visage in the mirror, wondering just where it was that Matilda went when she was gone. Randall was running late, as the note from Frank said. So, when they finally finished the preparations for the evening, Maddie dismissed Mrs. Fitz and sat in Matilda's bedroom, watching flurries out of the window. The flakes swirled and danced, and coupled with the bit of wine she had still in her veins and the thrill of having control of the spotty once more, Maddie watched for quite some time, simply reveling in the serene moment. The clock chimed the hour, six o'clock. The gala began at seven, and still no word from Randall. She was starting to wonder if she'd been at last stood up. Walking over to the vanity, Maddie rifled through the drawers. To her surprise, she found the compact that Randall had given her, the one she'd used to speak to John Iosheka, Ian's twain. Yes, she had stowed it there for safekeeping before welcoming Matilda back. Without much more thought, she opened it up and pressed her finger to the stone as Randall had shown her, half curious and half doubtful that anything would happen. At first, nothing did happen, and she was quite ready to have done with it. Then the fabric began to bleed colors again, and John's face appeared. Why, Madeline, he said, I didn't expect to see you again so soon. Wait, how do you know I'm not Matilda, she asked. Matilda despises me soundly. She would not contact me, even if her life depended on it. Would you like to come for a visit? he asked. Maddie could make out details behind him, vaguely brown and black walls like a log cabin. I'm not sure I can get to where you are. Besides, I have somewhere to be in an hour or so. You'll be fashionably late, as always. If it's the gala at Count Gaskins, that's held every merrymas, and we can keep an eye out for your room just in case you're called away. It was tempting. I promise I'll be short, and you won't regret it, John pressed. Taking one look behind her, Maddie brought the compact up closer to her face. How, how will I get there? From what Randall said, you're quite far away. Use the compact, said John. Just press your lips to my portrait, and I will do the rest. All things considered, that's not the strangest set of instructions I've received since arriving here, Maddie said. She took a deep breath. Randall had given her no warnings about John and seemed to trust him with details about Alvin. And if Matilda took issue, she was not speaking up. It's simply the best mechanism. Come now, there's nothing to worry about. He was as convincing as Ian. Maddie leaned forward and put her lips on the fabric inside the compact. It was rough, like burlap or coarse linen, and she tried to pull away, but she couldn't. The sensation was much like being stung by a thistle. Her lips erupted in pins and needles, followed by her tongue and the roof of her mouth, next her face and neck. In a few heartbeats, her entire body was prickling, painful, tickling, itching. And then she slipped. The world turned on its head and she went with it. Maddie's whole body went freezing cold and she was plummeted into the dark. Then with a whoosh of air in her lungs, light returned. In a flash, she was sitting in a wooden chair wrapped in furs, thick golden furs. The room itself was lit by fire and little else. It was quite dark. A log cabin, yes, but rustic and far from the sort she'd seen advertised in magazines at home. She was also quite naked under the furs. John knelt before her, staring into her face as if they had indeed just kissed. He was older than Ian by at least two decades, his long black hair shot with silver, and he looked decidedly native, not least because of the feathers and beads in his hair. But he wore a white linen shirt like the ones by gentlemen in town, a little threadbare about the collar, and trousers and boots. There we go, John pronounced. Maddie shivered. Her goosebumps had goosebumps. Why are my clothes gone? She asked. You will be returned to them if that's what you're worrying. Then when you get back, things just don't quite translate the same way across the border, John said. But the fur should be quite comfortable. It's a lion's pelt. A lion? Maddie asked. She was divided over thrusting it away in horror and snuggling into it for more warmth. It was delightfully comfortable, and it smelled strangely familiar. 
I could have brought you back as a dove, John said cryptically, standing and going to the window. He opened a crude leather shade and peered out, then looked back at her. Thanks, I think, Maddie said. Never thought of myself as much of a dove. John gave her a knowing smile. You have a dove's heart. For some reason, Maddie blushed and looked away. It was dark outside the cabin, and she noticed the play of light behind the shade. Is someone else here, she asked. My wife, John said. She'd like to meet you. Maddie looked down at her hands. She was still holding the compact. For the first time, she noticed the device etched into the top, an eight-pointed star. We all used to have those, John said, indicating the compact and then walking to the fireplace. He poked the smoldering logs, and they hissed and popped in reply. But there's only one left, and technically it should be Matilda's. But she's not proven herself worthy of it. Yeah, she's a bit of a spitfire, said Maddie, cringing momentarily, waiting for her twain to surface, but there was no response. When she's of a mind to do something, she's virtually unstoppable. We're not on good terms, she and I, said John. Her current incarnation is more vile than I can recall in a very long time. Incarnation? Maddie asked. It was starting to make sense to Maddie, something beyond Twain's and transcorporeal travel. What was it that Mora had said? You were a part of her. But at the time, she had supposed that meant Maddie herself, or Mora. They were Twain's, all a part of each other, and yet John had a casual sincerity to him on the subject. Maddie recalled a few Eastern philosophies about reincarnation, how some believe in the continual rebirth of groups of people. In one life, one best friend might be one person, but in another life, that very same soul might be born into a sister or a mother or an uncle. But they clustered. Hadn't Randall mentioned clusters? John was about to answer Maddie when the door opened, clattering on its hinges, and a woman wrapped in furs entered. Her eyes were slanted, her hair jet black and braided. Her lips were thick, almost pursed, and her cheekbones stood out prominently against her olive skin. Across her shoulder, she carried a day's worth of kills, two long white foxes, a beaver, and a clutch of birds. There was a bow slung on her back, too, wrapped with cord on one side and strung with gut on the other. And though Maddie couldn't see them, she had a feeling the woman carried with her a great many knives and strange hunting wares. The wind blew the door open, and the woman turned to close it again. Pinga, there you are, John said. His face softened to see her, a look of true affection. But Pinga was steel-faced. This is the one? Pinga asked. We are not, did she, did she get the lion fur? Reflexively, Maddie had expected Pinga to have some strange accent, but her English was impeccable. She came with it, said John, but she isn't here for long. I hoped we could discuss things a bit together. It seems Madeline here is beginning to figure things out. You mean no one's told her? Pinga asked, tossing down her kills on a long table. It was stained in a variety of places, no doubt from continual use in skinning and deboning. The huntress took off some of her layers of clothing, mostly made of skin and fur, until she was in a wool tunic and high boots, then began to skin the foxes as if they were the most normal thing in the world to be doing. I think Randall's tried a few times, Maddie said, feeling uncomfortable, as Pinga's knife came down on the fox and slipped its skin from muscle. The smell wasn't too great either. If Boston felt like a Victorian nightmare, then this was the Dark Ages. He gets a little distracted when his philosophies and all his research. Pinga snorted, he's in love with you. He doesn't want to hurt you or confuse you more than he already has. He he loves Matilda, corrected Maddie. Pinga stopped slicing and smirked at Maddie. (laughs) Same thing. Still, he's been watching you for the last five years. I'm more confused than I was when I started, Maddie said. I feel like I'm missing something. You are, said Pinga, going back to her work. But you're practically a baby. So I've been told, said Maddie with a touch of bitterness. That compact you hold is very old, my dear, John said, and it represents the very essence of who and what you are. You made it once, another version of you, I should say, along with another version of me. So in addition to this whole Twain thing, they were also reincarnated, Maddie said. It sounded a lot less crazy when vocalized somehow. John hoisted an iron cauldron and positioned it over the fire. Indeed, and we can live a very long time. Eight worlds, eight sets of twains, each with similarly characteristic and ruling passions, you might say. Rarely do eight exist across worlds at the same moment. It makes things more complicated, John said. Miriam here is in the second world, whom you have not met as one such instance. She currently shares twains across all eight worlds simultaneously. But we're not on speaking terms, she and I, so do not know what the effects may be. You fight? Maddie asked. Don't all siblings? 
Pinga asked. Do we all look alike? Maddie asked, remembering Mora, who said she was part of Maddie, who said she was a twain but looked as different as possible. I mean, Matilda and I are different enough, but you're both, well, you look like Native Americans. Pinga replied, with practice, many twains can alter their visages as much as they want, until race and creed mean nothing. Think of eight worlds, like points on an eight-pronged star, like the etching on your compact. Second and sixth are nearly mirrors of one another, are they not? John explained. As if the compact were aware of its discussion, it began to shake in Maddie's hands. Then she heard a voice from inside, soft and tentative. Mrs. Roth? Mr. Roth has sent you word to meet him at the landing. I've sent the carriage for you whenever you're ready. Mrs. Fitz, said Maddie, flipping over the open the compact. The room beyond was dark, lit by the suggestion of firelight. You don't want to keep him waiting, Pinga said. She made her way to the birds now, and feathers fell at her feet, sticky with blood. But I had more questions about Alvin, about Matilda, Maddie protested, but she felt herself slipping already. Whatever magic, she hated using that term, but it was the only one that fit, had brought her here was dwindling. About magic and, and transcorporeal travel. John went to her and knelt again, putting his hands on her shoulders. He looked so much like Ian and yet so much more wild. It did him a great deal of good. Try not to worry too much. You'll have enough time for that come tomorrow. Matilda is your key to Alvin, but don't trust her too much. You'll find help and answers, I promise. His words were comforting, but they spoke nothing of her own world. I just want to go home, Maddie said. Do you? John asked. Then he pressed his lips to hers, and she fell back into Matilda's room, the now familiar sensation of the corset pressing at her ribs. Mrs. Roth? asked Mrs. Fitz at the door. Are you all right? Mr. Roth is in a carriage. Coming! Maddie said, checking Matilda's reflection one last time. She'd come back without so much as a feather out of place. Sorry to keep you waiting. Count Gaskin's mansion floated some thousand feet above Boston, and reaching it required a short trip via air balloon, Maddie learned. First, she was taken by carriage to a special docking station made just for the journey. She could only describe the landing and connected structure as a Victorian ski lift, Except rather than being hung with swings, it was bedecked with scarlet and gold tasseled balloons. The length of it, all the way up to the mansion, was lit with strings of lights that could not quite have been flames, but must have been something like phosphorus, for they cast a green glow on the metal framework. The door to the carriage opened, and Maddie spied Randall a few steps up, leaning on the brass rail, waiting for her. He saw her immediately, and descended the stairs, his tails flapping behind him. He was dressed as flawlessly as she, his outfit the same pale green, the waistcoat shot with copper. Maddie didn't know how he managed it since Matilda hadn't mentioned her dressing plans to him. Perhaps Mrs. Fitz had coordinated. His hair had been combed and tied back with gold ribbon, his glasses polished and catching the light. His eyes moved behind them, cautious, full of emotion. They had not left on the best of terms. You look beautiful he said softly, holding out his hand to hers. Maddie reached out to grab his hands, feeling the warmth of them even through her kid gloves. It was snowing again, and Randall ushered her toward the awning below the dock. Thank you, Mr. Roth, said Maddie gently. You look like quite the picture yourself. He sniffed. You smell like a fire. She grinned in spite of herself. I visited John briefly. Physically? Randall asked, his mouth agape. Yes! Mostly, I mean, my clothes didn't translate, but I, wh what did you speak of, he asked. He looked worried. Maddie shrugged. He mentioned that Twains were reincarnated. He told me a little about the eight worlds and their structure. It made a surprising amount of sense. I mean, in as much as anything makes sense these days. Maddie, I, look, it's our turn, Maddie said, pointing up to the servant, arranging the seats. Don't want to miss the flight. We can talk about this later, okay? For some reason, I'm really excited about attending this party. I hope you're not afraid of heights, he whispered, as they walked side by side, inclining their heads as people greeted them. Lords and ladies, many of them, as Matilda had mentioned, leaning toward the more robust dimension, made their way up the landing to the air balloons along with them. From this distance, Maddie could see the full balloon structure, including a car at the bottom of it, capable of holding a few people at a time. Maddie looked up and saw a half dozen other balloons all rising along a thick rope, running the length between them and the floating mansion. Listen, about earlier, Maddie said, 
Apologies and discussions of your adventures while I was gone can wait for a while, don't you think? You said it yourself, said Randall. For now, I just want to enjoy the view. Oh? Maddie asked, as he helped her into the car below the balloon. It was theirs alone, and cold though it was, Maddie felt quite cozy with Randall nearby. Yes, my dear, he said. Prepare yourself for a feast of the eyes and a famine of the soul. As the balloon took flight, Maddie caught her breath in amazement. All of Boston fell away beneath them, cloaked in the light of the setting sun, the snow cast in glittering gold. The river flashed silver, carriages wound back and forth about their business. The buildings, some looking as if they'd grown out of the harbor, looked like dollhouses from up so high. I don't tire of the view, said Randall, pointing toward the harbor. I thought, what a stupid idea to have a home up here, but now I see. It's like strings of pearls and light, Maddie replied. I had no idea. The balloon stopped at the front of the manor where a carriage house might be. As they exited, Maddie continued to stare higher up. The balloons holding the home up floated far above them like smooth clouds in the distance. But every now and again, a plane would zigzag by, as Randall informed Maddie, to check on their current status. While no palace had fallen yet, it was still a possibility, and an event that counts was no time to let the guard down. They passed through a stone arch, which Randall explained was not stone at all, but a kind of plaster resin. Cutting corners to reduce the weight of the building was necessary in such a situation, but Maddie was amazed at how much attention to detail had been given. No single block was the same, and the arch was weathered to look like something from an English gatehouse. And the theme continued, as the entire palace was reminiscent of an English castle, except brighter and cleaner. All the windows in the expansive manse were lit from within, glass paned in a multitude of colors. The grounds were covered in a blanket of snow, pine trees and topiaries decorated with red and gold candles, baubles and silver icicles. Holly, ivy, and a few hardy trees with red berries adorned the walkways, winding around in garlands when they approached the staircase, which was carpeted in thick red velvet. Gives new meaning to deck the halls, Maddie muttered as she nodded to the butlers on either side of the door and stepped into the mahogany inlaid entrance hall. I've never seen such an elaborate party. It's our favorite festival, of course, said Randall. Merrymas, when Mary's divinity was realized, when she was brought into the greatest mystery of all said Randall softly, squeezing her arm almost affectionately. The Count spares no expense. He holds three balls, this being the second during the season. John said he's not on good terms with Mary, Maddie said, recalling the conversation, and that there were eight of her twins across the world? Yes, that is the case. Mary, Miriam, and John are locked in quite an impasse. But there was no time for more conversation, as the crowd soon swallowed them up. They were seemingly a thousand faces amidst the swirling of skirts and the bobbing of heads. Between the powder makeup and cleavage, Maddie had a difficult time orienting herself and keeping the name straight, so she continued to smile, continued to nod knowingly, and laugh when it seemed appropriate. There was no hint of Matilda, not lurking, not waiting. No, Maddie felt as if she was truly in control again, and she was giddy with it. The mental strain alone of dealing with Matilda was almost too much to bear. After making their way through the entrance hall, Maddie and Randall were ushered down through a sitting room and into the ballroom. Instead of marble, everything was inlaid wood. The flooring was a dizzying pattern of rosettes and ivy leaves, then carved columns painted like oaks. The twenty-foot ceilings were brilliant in gold leaf and white, hung with mirrors, and touched along the length with chandeliers, dripping crystals. Someone was playing the harp and another violin. Maddie thought she could hear the sounds of other instruments, but couldn't quite pick them out. It was warm in the room, and she gave her stole to a butler who took it away for her while a server offered her a glass of mulled wine. Randall's arm was a constant comfort amidst the throng. I must admit, Mrs. Roth, the gown you're wearing tonight is extraordinary, said a corpulent gentleman to her right. He had a white mustache and the complexion of a boiled lobster. The woman on his arm, his wife presumably, was half his age but twice his size. Her breasts were proudly hoisted and nearly exposed to the nipples due to the magnificent silver corset at her waist, and Maddie tried not to stare. She was dressed in layers of custard yellow chiffon, her red hair pinned up with a thousand tiny pearls. She wore an amber-colored gemstone around her neck as big as Maddie's fist. The fat, red-faced man continued when Maddie stared at him a little dumpily. 
what say you we make for one of my make one for my Annette here? I think green would suit her wonderfully. Uh, of course, Maddie said. She decided that Annette looked like a late life Henry the Eighth, except without the beard. She had a blank expression on her face, but smiled very sweetly. Mrs. Roth can, of course, come by for a fitting in your home, said Randall, suddenly all business. You know where to reach us. We are happy to accommodate. A horn blared, and Randall pointed to the front of the room, squeezing Maddie's hand as he did so. And there is the Count. <laughs>